just to introduce myself, who I am, where I'm coming from, I am a computer scientist. I'm a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths. I teach in the computing department. Um, but I am also a musician. I'm a flutist by training and got into this vein of work through my work with musicians, um, including Jeff, by the way. Um, and in the last 10 years or so, I've branched out a bit. I work with game designers. I work with people with disabilities. I'm not just focused on composition anymore, but music is really where my roots are. So I'm happy to go into depth and talk about the musical implications of any of this. So um, before we get started, who here has used machine learning at all in their work? Wow. OK, about half of you. Very cool. Um, so. For the other half of you, I'm going to start out with a really quick, easy introduction. I want everybody to leave here knowing basically what machine learning is. Um, I don't want you to be scared of it. I also don't want you to be swayed by Elon Musk and a lot of the hype out there, which I think has nothing very interesting to do with a lot of the stuff you guys are working on. And in fact, there's a whole lot of really fascinating avenues, ways that we can think about machine learning as a creative tool far beyond what you see the media picking up on, what you see random people on Twitter you know, going on about, about the latest thing that, you know, there's, there's hype everywhere. And I want to try to break through a little bit of that. Um, and for me, especially as a musician, I'm really not so interested in how we make machine learning systems that replace people, who you know, replace composers, replace musicians. That's kind of the least interesting thing I can think of to do. Um, so I want to get all of you thinking about other possibilities and, and maybe ways that this might help you in the kind of practice that you're doing. OK, so let's talk about machine learning. First of all, um, you can think about machine learning as a set of tools for finding patterns in data. And I'm going to teach this first five minutes as if we were a traditional computer science course. I'm going to tell you about the non-creative definition of machine learning. Um, and of course, if you take a computer science machine, er, machine learning course, you're often going to be motivated, or your instructor thinks they're going to motivate you by talking about making money. So let's pretend you own a store. Maybe it's an online shop of some sort. And you collect data from all the people who visit that online shop, right? People do this all the time. There are trackers following you all around. By the time you get to a new website, it's capable of knowing quite a lot about you. And so let's say that you, know, you have a bunch of people who've come to your online shop in the past, and you have demographic information, maybe purchase information. Um, one of the things that you can do with this data is Look for patterns, perhaps seeing that there are some sets of customers that have commonalities and other sets of customers who have other commonalities. Right? And maybe you want to market to these sets of customers in different ways. Or maybe you see that the customers who are really there are not the ones you thought you had. Right? So that's one use of machine learning, very commonly used in practice. Another way you can use machine learning is to use these patterns to make predictions. So let's say you have these customers. Let's say you're, you're running an online music shop, by the way, and you're selling people albums. And these customers have bought this album. <laughs> and these customers have bought this album. And if you're able to take those observations, you can probably build, with enough observations, a predictive model. So that when you get a new potential customer who comes into your shop, you can look at that demographic data or anything else you know about them, and you might predict that they're going to be more interested in this album. Right? And we'll come back to this type of machine learning. I'm going to show you some ways that we can really co-opt this and use this for creative purposes. Um, and then a third way of using machine learning is to generate new similar content. And this is the type of machine learning or the scope of machine learning that's received, I would say, the most attention in creative communities in the last few years. Um, but again, I want you to know it's not the only type. And this is interesting because it suddenly doesn't make quite as much sense in a, a business making, you know, making money context, at least not for our shop. But if we just look at this data and we say, well, these are pictures of cats. Um, certain generative machine learning algorithms, if we give them enough pictures of cats, they can generate new pictures of cats that don't exist. Um, so you can actually download this um, in case you were worried that we'd run out of cat pictures on the internet. We're not going to. Um, and of course, you can do this with any kind of content, um, any kind of media, more or less successfully. Um, in music, somebody took exactly this algorithm and applied it to making album art covers. 
So this is pretty cool. This is not quite the state of the art anymore. Um, people are getting even better at this, but these certainly look like album art covers. Um, we can do this with audio. Um, this is WaveNet. Some of you may have heard of this or even played around with it. Um, so this is a generative model, very much like what you just saw on the previous slide. But the input to this model is a bunch of audio samples. So it's not MIDI, it's raw audio, and it's audio from classical piano music albums. And the algorithm um, is basically being asked, OK, generate us some new audio streams that sound like this content but not identical to it. So here we go. So that's, again, not completely the state of the art right now in 2019, but it's very close. And you see that this you know, is incredible, right? It's definitely a <laughs> piano. It's in some sort of classical genre. Um, it's definitely lacking some of the larger scale structure that we as musicians might care about if we wanted to actually make a composition system. But there are lots of researchers working on this. Um, one of my other really favorite um, examples in the realm of music is people doing um, work with non-audio content. Um, this is uh, from Janelle Shane on uh, Twitter. She's hilarious. She's kind of made a name for herself by taking generative content algorithms and applying them to like anything she can find, any kind of data set. Um, this is, as you see, machine learning generated metal band names. And these are like clearly in the metal genre. Right, Dragon Red of Blood, Death Crack, um, Chaos Warge Le Plague, right? These are just, <laughs> there's a lot of character here, right? Uh, I'll come back to Janelle Shane a little bit later. But this is just a really high level overview of some of the stuff happening in this space that you should be aware of. Now, because work like Janelle Shane's, like WaveNet, has been getting, I would say, a lot of media attention in the last few years. Um, Often people, not hopefully not people in this room, um, look at these types of algorithms and say, oh goodness, um, this isn't very good. Um, are machines really capable of making art? Um, or isn't it terrible that once these algorithms get better, there are not gonna be any more jobs for creative people? Um, or people say, well, the best thing we can do, or the only thing we can do for human creators is to make algorithms that are better at realistically reproducing art, music, et cetera, to make these metal band name generators better, to make this piano generator better, and so on. And actually, this is the thing that I often hear from machine learning researchers working in this space. All of these things make me kind of sad. I think these are, these are the wrong questions. Um, you know, whether it's, this is real art or not really depends on your definition of art. Um, I'm not, again, not so worried that these systems are going to replace, you know, the sorts of things that you are doing, you know, if you're a PhD student right now or if you're an academic right now, they're not really going to replace you. They're going to replace some kinds of tasks and we can talk about that. Um, but there's a whole lot of other potential to integrate into tasks that we currently do or even enable us to do things that we couldn't do before. So um, in my work, I'm really interested in exploring what, it, what does that space really look like. So I'm, I'm asking, how can machine learning support people's existing creative practices or extend people's creative abilities? Um, and as I mentioned, my roots in this space are really in music, although I think about this in a variety of domains. So based on that definition of machine learning that I gave you earlier, we could unpack this a bit and, and ask, well, when and why is it creatively useful to find patterns in data, to make predictions, or to generate new data? Right? If those are our three basic ingredients, how might those help us in our practices? And how might we build um, tools, for example, to actually enable people to do this? So that's uh, another big piece of my research is actually building software, educating people, um, trying to enable creators to use data and machine learning effectively because frankly it's not that interesting if it's just computer science PhDs who are trying to do this stuff. It's much more interesting if other people are doing this. Okay, so I started down this path of work, goodness, maybe 14 years ago, something like that. 
Um, and at that point in time, I got really interested in how people in um, the contemporary music scene, the computer music scene, were using different sources of data in their practice. Um, we were starting to see lots of use of um, cameras. Obviously, you know, people have used live audio as an input in computer music for a long time. Um, we were starting to see people using social media data with you know, the first use of the Twitter API, writing pieces that incorporated um, Twitter feeds or Twitter keywords, hashtags in some way. We were also starting to see things like the first smartphones, things that people carried around with them everywhere that had a bunch of sensors in them. Um, we were seeing Arduinos and other DIY kits where you could put, plug in a bunch of sensors and build instruments. And again, of course, people have been building new music instruments with digital sensors um, and analog sensors for that matter for many, many years. But this was really taking off as the affordability and usability of a lot of these tools started um, to look better. Um, and of course, we can look at these as sources of data, where machine learning might help us find patterns in this data. Um, and now, fast forward to 2019, there are all sorts of other things that you are all probably doing, that other people who are creators are doing, that we can also look at it sources, as sources of data, right? So we can look at, you know, if you are, well, I don't have my, my DAW image on here, but if you're interacting with the DAW, what edits do you make? How do you EQ a track? Which samples do you throw out and which do you keep, right? If you imagine keeping track of that information, that's data. We could find patterns in that. We could learn to mimic your actions and so on. Same thing with tools like Photoshop. Um, and then, of course, there are giant, giant sources of data on the web or um, in third-party services that we can access with an API. So machine learning, in principle, may allow us to do lots of stuff with this data. OK, so I want to start with talking about this type of machine learning um, for making predictions. And often, we're going to use something called supervised learning to do this. And so if we think about supervised learning as building this you know, album recommendation system, where we've got um, you know, data about some customer, potential customer, we want to predict what album should we recommend to them, what are they likely to buy. We can take the same infrastructure to build musical instruments, something I was really interested in, um, by saying, well, forget that you know, customer purchased information, and said so let's re replace that with data from sensors, data that gives us some idea of how a performer is moving on stage or how they're interacting with some sort of tangible system. And then our prediction is really what kind of sound do we want to be produced based on how that person is moving. Um, we can also use the same infrastructure for audiovisual performance. Um, maybe we have an acoustic musician who's playing some kind of material and we want to make some visuals. Um, or we want to make a robot dance or whatever. We want something to happen um, that's digitally mediated. We could say, well, I want to take this audio data as my input and I want to predict what kind of visuals I want as my output. Same infrastructure. Um, and again, of course, this applies in all sorts of other creative contexts as well. Um, at the moment, I'm working with a bunch of game developers, um, building some tools where they can build gesturally controlled games, voice controlled games, biosignal controlled games, where you could maybe say a word and then your avatar does a thing, right? All using machine learning rather than programming. Okay. So um, in a minute, I'm going to do a demo and hopefully make this a little bit more clear. Um, I'm going to demo using some software that I wrote. I wrote the first version of this starting in about 2008. Wrote a new version of, of it about four years ago. Um, it's been downloaded about 25,000 times now, and it's been used in all sorts of really cool stuff, which I'll talk about. But it's a really simple interface to allow people to do this kind of supervised learning, where you want some kind of input, usually from sensors or audio or video, but some kind of data coming in. And you want to stick a predictive model there. And then you want to use that to do some kind of real-time control. Um, and the software is totally modular. And because you're all musicians, I'm going to tell you that I'm just getting OSC in and sending OSC out. So you could stick PD here. You can stick Max here. You can stick Processing here, whatever you want, Ableton. Um, and then on the input side, again, this could be data coming from Max or PD. It could be data coming from something that you write yourself to get you know, sensor data or social media API data or whatever. 
right? So kind of anything on top, anything on bottom, machine learning in the middle. OK, so let's do a couple demos. Um, first demo I like because I'm going to show you if I can find it. Um, I call this the worst computer vision system ever. Um, basically, I'm just taking data from my webcam and I'm downsampling it to a 10 by 10 grid. And so you can see that you know, as I move, the data changes um, and stuff's happening. Now, I'm a pretty good programmer, right? I have a PhD in computer science. Um, I would not really enjoy the task of taking this 10 by 10 matrix of numbers and trying to write a program to make sense of it. Right? And if you've worked with sensors or if you've worked with audio, you probably know this feeling that you're like, well, yeah, I could probably make something work, but this is not going to be fun and it's going to take a while. So what we're going to do instead is use machine learning to build that model for us. Um, and what I'm going to do is hook this up to a really simple drum machine patch in Chuck. And I'm going to teach it to predict what sound I want to be played based on what I'm doing in front of the camera. So um, I've got Wekinator here. It's going to listen for these 100 values. And it's going to send just one value out. And I'm going to build a classifier, because I just want to choose how many drum sounds to play. I'm not doing anything complicated. All right. So what, now what I'm going to do, I can't you know, go online and download the ground truth data set for me in front of this webcam controlling a drum machine the way that you would if you were doing more conventional machine learning problems, right? Instead, I'm going to make the data set right here. We're going to use a really small data set, and it's going to work quickly, and it's going to be really tailored just for me in these clothes, under these lights, and so on, which is exactly what I need. So um, I'm going to give it, first of all, some examples of me standing here. And so here, it just took sort of 18 snapshots of me standing in front of the camera. And I've told it, when you see this, play the sound that you hear right now. And I'm going to give it now a different sound and some examples of me not standing in front of the camera. And now I'm going to build a machine learning system from those examples. OK? So haven't had to code anything. It mostly works, but I can get it to make some mistakes. So I'm going to try to find a place where it messes up. So it seems to mess up somewhere right in here. So I'm going to give it some more examples and say, all of this is me. right? And now I can add those examples to the previous data and tell it to rebuild that predictive model. It's a little bit better. We're going to give it even more examples. OK, that's pretty good. Let's see if it still works over here. There we go. OK, so I've corrected it by giving it examples. And if I'm happy with that, I can make it more complicated. Maybe say, here's my hand in front of the camera. And that's a third type of sound. And again, if I'm not happy with it, I just give it some more examples of my hand. OK, so that's the basic idea of using machine learning to build a predictive model from very few examples, taking some real-time input, and controlling some sound. Um, I want to give you one other demo, which is a little bit more indicative of how most composers who've used this have, have taken advantage of um, this kind of machine learning. And for this one, I'm going to use um, a different sensor. I'm going to use a leap motion. I don't know if everybody knows what this is. Seeing nods. OK. So here we've got my hand sensed from the leap. And this little patch just takes the XYZ position of my five fingertips. So I've got 15 data points, really, for every moment in time, telling me where my fingertips are in front of the sensor. And I'm going to build a little instrument that uses my hand to control my favorite synthesis patch. Um, this is Blotar. I don't know if you know Blotar, but it's awesome. 
Ooh. So, so this is a physical model. Um, I've got nine values in bloat of blotar, parameters for blotar that I want to control in real time. And I'm just going to give you a little exploration of the blotar parameter space so you can see how sonically interesting and diverse it is. Right, so that's just a, s a peek at some sounds in the blotar space. So if I'm going to build um, an instrument that allows me to control blotar in a performance, I've got a really difficult task, right? So I need to find, you know, sounds that I like are going to be essentially points in this nine-dimensional space. Now, music that I like is going to be trajectories through this nine-dimensional space in time. And that's pretty hard, right? That's what you guys have all done pieces where you're trying to, you know, adjust that many sliders to get to some kind of sound that you like. And you know that it's tedious, especially as was mentioned before, when you change one value, the effects that other values have change. Um, but if I want to build an instrument, this gets even harder because I now need to figure out a function that has 15 inputs that maps to those nine outputs. And this needs to be able to give me comfortable places to put my hand. Um, maybe um, I want to match comfortable trajectories for me in hand space to musically useful trajectories in sound space. And, and probably I don't want to do anything that's really embarrassing with my hand if I'm going to do this in front of an audience. Right? So this is a hard design problem. And as a programmer, again, you know, the easiest thing I can do is just kind of say, well, this finger controls this value, this finger controls this value, and so on. Um, and we've all written patches like that because it's easy to code. Um, but of course, there's research out there. If you guys have read um, any of Marcello Wanderley's stuff, you know that actually mapping in more complicated ways can make more interesting instruments. It can give, make instruments that feel more natural to control, that are easier for people to learn how to play rather than sitting there and thinking, OK, well, this finger is the pitch, and this finger is the volume, and how do I actually learn how to play this? So we're going to use machine learning to build this mapping function instead of writing it in Max or something else. And again, we're going to say 15 inputs. And now I want to control nine things. And I don't just want to choose a class or a label or a category. I want to control these nine values continuously, as if I had nine sliders. And so I'm going to start out by finding a sound that I like. And maybe I want this sound in my instrument. And maybe I want this to kind of be my default sound where I hang out right here. So I'm going to give it some examples. That's just 10 snapshots of my hand here. And maybe I want the sound, the pitch to go up as I move my hand up a little bit. So my hand's up here. Give it some more examples. And now I've got my pitch control, right? And I could build myself a little mini theremin here. But we all know theremins are hard to play and not very satisfying sometimes. So I'm going to add some totally different sounds here. And here I'm going to make sort of a claw shape down here in the corner, and that's going to be this sound. So let's give it some claw, add that to the data, and now see what we've got. All right, so as you see, it still retains some of that idea that height is going to change pitch somehow, but it's given me this huge explosion in timbral possibilities, right? And it's given me that without much time, without me having to code. And if I, of course, if I don't like it, I just throw away all this data and I give it new examples. Um, and I can keep iterating on this by adjusting the examples that I give it until I have something that I'm happy with. All right. Any questions about this before I move on? Yeah. Are you sending the OSC data back from Max? Yeah, there's a little trick here. You see this, um, this part of the patch um, where I change preset values in Max, it's going to automatically update in Weckinator just so I don't have to change back and forth between the screens.
Yeah. When you're um, working with some kind of audio input, mm -hmm. um, do you have to then sort of degrade it to message array index and send over OSCs? Yeah, so in general, unless you're doing deep learning yeah. um, with lots and lots and lots and lots of data, which we're not doing here because we don't want to spend 20 days generating data examples, um, if you're not doing deep learning, you, no matter what kind of machine learning algorithm you use, you're going to want some kind of more um, compressed, more informative representation for audio than just the raw samples. So in practice, what you would do, and I have a bunch of examples of this on the Wekinator website, is you would extract something like an FFT, or you could use MFCCs or RMS, or make up your own features that capture whatever aspects of the audio um, are most relevant to what you care about. And of course, you can do buffering and windowing and averaging and all that stuff. So there's a lot of, you know, creative practice and potentially manual labor in coming up with a feature representation. But there, at least, you know, you can draw on existing libraries. You can draw on uh, research about perceptual features. And there's some good standard tools that you have at your disposal. So yeah, when I do audio, um, I'm usually using something like one of these. I should also mention. Yeah, so the um, Wekinator is free. It's cross-platform. It's open source. And if you go to the website, you have your pick of all sorts of inputs. So for instance, there's a bunch of audio examples here in different environments you can work from. And then there's a bunch of output examples. So if you want to connect it to PD or Max or if this, then that, or Arduinos or whatever, you can do that. Other questions about this? Yeah. Um, the Wekinator is like, from what I can see, I've never used it really easy to use. But is there an option, like a, a side of it that's a bit more like you can get under the hood? Definitely, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that I haven't shown you. And um, for instance, I teach a one-term course at Goldsmiths and a, a sort of equivalent course online um, where we talk about what the algorithms are actually doing and how, you know, if I try to make that blowtar instrument and it doesn't work, how might I change not just the data but the machine learning algorithm in some way to make it work better? Or how might I choose better features if I'm working with audio? Um, so there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you, I've taught seven-year-olds how to use this and they get it. They can do essentially the demos that I showed you. Um, but if you, you know, each little bit more that you learn about machine learning or about data representations, um, the more powerful a tool machine learning ends up being. Yeah. Other questions? OK, let's uh, move on. So let's turn off the blowtar. OK, so the second part of my talk, um, I want to just give you some highlights about my research. So in addition to building tools and thinking about how to teach creative people machine learning, um, I'm, you know, written a bunch of papers as a researcher about, you know, why is this potentially useful? How is it useful? What's challenging about it? Um, how might this complement other kinds of practices that people are, are engaged in? Um, so this is a, a really high level tour of sort of stuff I've been thinking about for the last 10 years. So the first finding, and this is really the first thing that came out of my work, was that, yeah, my hunch that machine learning could be useful in instrument design ended up holding. Um, I've had people make some really incredible instruments. Um, and that now that Jeff is here, I'm sad I haven't updated the videos to show you some of the, the newer stuff. But these are some of my favorite old videos from some of the first users of Wekinator, um, who've, you know, I really think they've done fantastic work. So this is a piece by Anne Hagey, um, who used some PlayStation golf game controllers to build a really beautiful collaborative piece in which um, people's motions through a sort of sun salutation-like sequence end up having really beautiful effects on the sound. So let's see if I can play that.
So I like this piece. The whole thing's on Vimeo. Um, and of course, for this piece, Anne had a really specific set of motions for the performers in mind before creating the piece. And that would have been something very difficult to realize, to try to say, OK, what, you know, how do I write that mapping function to look at how people are moving through the sequence and then match that to the types of sound sequences that feel natural or feel right for that? Um, another one of the first instruments built with Wekinator was Michelle Nagai's Martlet. Um, this is a giant piece of tree bark that she wears on stage, and it's got 25 light sensors embedded into the bark. And so she plays this instrument by casting shadows over the sensors with her hands and sort of leaning into and away from the spotlight on stage. And of course, this instrument is very much like the, um, the webcam example I showed you here, right? trying to take 25 values in, even though that's tiny for a computer, that's a lot to think about for humans. And it just becomes really arduous and probably not so creatively fun to try to hack something together that uses those values in a meaningful way. Um, people have made some really cool art projects with this. Um, this is from a student at the School for Poetic Computation who, um, you, this is a, an art piece where you wear a webcam on your head and it uses Wekinator to identify whether there are any screens in sight. So um, TVs, laptops, mobile phones. And if there's a screen, it takes these special glasses and makes them opaque. So you're incapable of looking at a screen when you wear this piece. I need a pair for either. What? I need a pair for I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, this, is, this is an example of some work that a student made in just a, a one-day workshop that I taught. Um, she used the Leap Motion and an Arduino and just wanted to make a robot that waves at you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is HiBot. Um, and I love this, right? It's super fun, probably not worth your time spending like a week making HiBot, but totally worth like half an hour. Um, she could make millions. <laughs> and she could customize them to every, every different person's wave. Um, so as I mentioned, I've had about 25,000 users at this point. A lot of them are students around the world learning um, computer music or digital art or physical computing. Um, it's been used by some other musicians you might know of, uh, Leticia Tsunami. So these are Chicks on Speed. Um, People have made projects, everything from new instruments to interactive digital puppet shows to um, commercial products, interfaces for people with disabilities, and then random stuff on Twitter. I always get people tweeting like, this guy made a um, croissant espresso detector, where depending on what food you hold up, he connected it to the Google Maps API. So if you hold up a croissant, it'll take you to Paris. If you hold up an espresso, it'll take you to Milan. Um, so these are fun, right? These are, these are fun projects. Um, now, interestingly, as a computer scientist, one of the harder lessons for me to learn was that the way that machine learning researchers think about data in most applications is just not appropriate here. That, you know, in most machine learning classes that you might take, we talk about data as ground truth, right? Data is something you gather from the world and you try to make a really accurate model of that data because probably you don't understand as a human how the stock market works, but you want to predict it more accurately. Or you don't understand how some, you know, a complicated set of medical tests work together and you want to predict more accurately whether some treatment is appropriate for a patient. Um, but here, we're not using data in that way. Data is actually instead an interface for somebody to communicate to a computer, right? I'm communicating through these examples I'm giving what kinds of movements I want to make and what kinds of sounds I want to be paired with those movements. And it might be fairly arbitrary or not. It might be subjective. Um, but in either case, I'm sort of the expert. And I'm using data instead of code to tell the computer what I want it to do. Um, a really interesting outcome of this, this idea that we're using data instead of code to build things, well, number one, it's just faster, which is great. Um, but when I started interviewing early users of Wekinator and asking them, hey, you know, why are you using this instead of Max or whatever it is that you're an expert in, you're using this machine learning stuff that you don't understand very well instead, why is that? 
Um, speed had something to do with it, but actually people weren't spending less time making their instruments or making their projects. They were often spending the same amount of time as before or even more time, but they felt that that time was more productive because in, you know, really unsurprisingly in any sort of creative domain, the more you experiment, the more you prototype, the more you try things out and then modify them and try them out again, often the better your end result is, right? We can think about creative processes in music or in visual art or even, you know, in software engineering for that matter as really requiring iteration, right? We start a project with an idea in our heads about what we want to accomplish and then hopefully we make that thing. But as soon as we make that thing or a prototype of it, we try it out, we learn more about our ideas, right? We learn whether our ideas were good or maybe not so good. We also get hopefully ideas about how we could make that vision better, right? Um, and so again, this is important for any kind of creative practice. And one of the great things about using machine learning as opposed to coding, as I mentioned, it's faster, but also the kinds of mistakes it makes are different, right? If you um, make a mistake while you're writing code, often you're gonna get a compiler error. Or if you're in Max, you know, you get silence or you get, you know, a filter blowing up. Um, with machine learning, the way that a lot of these systems are configured, if it gives you something unexpected, it's often still gonna be in that parameter space. And it might be a sound that you've never heard before. It might be um, a relationship between your input and output that you've never thought of, but it's gonna do something. And that's often just more creatively useful than having nothing happen. And that can lead you to experiment um, further. Um, another important aspect of the, the difference between machine learning and writing code is that there are certain things that we care about as musicians, for example, that are really hard to articulate in code. Right? Um, it's hard for me to talk about what kind of quality of sound I want and then translate that into a set of filter coefficients. Right? It's hard for me to talk about how I want a performer to move on stage and then translate that into some sort of mathematical equation for their trajectory. Right? But it's a lot easier for me to either find examples of sounds that have a particular quality um, or to give examples of movements or you know, if I'm using other types of modalities often curating or creating examples are just way easier for us as people, right? And this relates to the types of tacit knowledge and embodied knowledge that we bring to creative practices. Um, so yeah, even if you're an expert coder, you've had this experience of there's, you know, there's stuff that's just really hard for you to articulate. It's not because you need to be a better coder, it's because as humans, yeah, there's stuff that we can break down into math easily and there's stuff that we can't. Um, and again, this ended up being, from the beginning, one of the unexpected lessons that I learned about why machine learning might be creatively useful. Um, another avenue that I've been um, exploring in my research a lot lately is the potential for building with examples rather than building with code to open up design to new people. So I've been running a um, few workshops with kids. As I mentioned, I've taught kids as young as seven to build musical instruments with uh, machine learning. It's really helpful for undergraduates who might not be great coders yet, but if you want to dig into a really deep, satisfying discussion with them about interaction design or musical instrument design, it's great to allow them to build stuff, even if they're not totally proficient in the details of some coding environment. Um, I've also recently been working with um, a bunch of music therapists and teachers in Northampton um, who primarily work with kids with a variety of disabilities. And here you see one of the teachers, actually two of the teachers, um, they now have a practice where they're, they're not using Wackinator, they're using an easier tool that I've built for them. Um, but they are building custom instruments for all their kids. Um, and they're not just building instruments, they're building experiences, musical experiences, compositions on the fly for different kids based on how different kids can move what kinds of music and sounds different kids like, how they might want to make, you know, ensemble collaborative experiences with a bunch of kids together. Um, and, you know, they're not computer scientists, they're not programmers, but they're doing amazing stuff that I would never have thought of because they, you know, this is their area of expertise. And then the last point I want to make, um, which of course um, is exciting to me, it's hopefully exciting to you, is that machine learning is a, set of tools that can open up new types of creative relationships between humans and machines. 
Um, and I want to make a, a brief detour here into something that's not in the music space, just because I like it so much. Um, has anybody seen Edges to Cats? Couple people. So this is sort of exemplary of a lot of the, the sort of deep learning based web tools that are out there. And there's a bunch of stuff like this. Um, this one allows you to draw an outline of a cat and it fills it in with the most cat-like thing that it can come up with. And again, this has been trained on thousands and thousands and thousands of images of cats. Um, and people have used this a lot. And <laughs> people have not been using this to replace human cat photographers. <laughs> people have not been using this to pr replace professional cat painters. Instead, people have been completely co-opting <laughs> this and making weird art You've got, yeah, cat octopus, cat Batman, cat bread. If you go on Google Images and you search edges to cats, you're going to get just thousands of images like this. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons I'm not so worried about machine learning just, you know, demolishing human creativity because people will take advantage of algorithms in really lovely ways. Um, and of course, I, I went, promised I'd come back to Janelle Shane. She's done a bunch of these text generation projects. One of my favorites is recipe names. And so she just you know, gave it thousands of recipe names. And it came out with things like beef soup with swamp beef and cheese, chocolate chops and chocolate chips, chocolate pickle sauce, whole chicken cookies, <laughs> out of meat, completely meat chocolate pie, crock pot cold water, right? So these are, these are hilarious, right? No human recipe writer has been replaced by this, but you're all laughing, right? This is, this is bringing people joy. And in fact, she has such rabid fans that love her work so much that some of them have actually made these into real projects. And like one person made a whole lovely illustrated guide to all these recipes, right? This is inspiring human creators, um, <coughs> right? This is, this is just great stuff. Um, on a more serious note, there are artists who are working with all sorts of types of machine learning in ways that I think are really fascinating. So one of those people is Mario Klingemann, um, and he talks about how using generative methods have really changed his approach to making work, and, and you know, he's, he makes beautiful, wonderful work. <laughs> he has not been replaced by algorithms. He certainly spends a lot of his time coding. He's making, you know, tuning these algorithms. He spends a lot of his time curating data, but, you know, he's, he's making really cool art. And he talks about the fact that he's producing lots and lots of these images. And one of his most important roles as an artist is actually um, figuring out which of those to keep. And he built a sort of Tinder-like interface that allows him to really quickly go through all these, you know, mostly really bad machine outputs and choose ones that are evocative in some way. Um, a musician I've worked with quite a bit and who I really respect is Letitia Sanami. Um, so this is one of her instruments, the one she's been working with the most in the last five years or so. Um, this is called Spring Spire. Um, and this, she's, she's built this with Wekinator from the beginning. So she's using um, audio pickups on three springs. And I can show you video of this if you're curious. But she's using audio features. Right, so she's using the springs as sensors. You don't hear the springs in the sound at all. And she's built lots and lots of Wekinator models to control a super complicated max patch. Um, and so she's, again, none of this is hard-coded mappings. This is all mappings that have been learned with Wekinator, where she keeps training and retraining and refining over a period of many years. And when she talks about why she uses machine learning in her work, she talks about this different relationship to the machine. Um, she says, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You kind of want it to be a little wild, and you want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull, right? which I think is great. Um, she's somebody who's very critical of this idea that we um, should, or that we even do, have a relationship with computers in which we're sort of the masters. And 
the computer is the slave and everything that happens as a result of us having great ideas in our heads and just dictating to the computer, right? And that's, of course, that's a common view of what it means to make usable software in many domains, is that we need to give people better and better abilities to take those ideas they have in their head and just realize them efficiently. Um, and for her, that's really not the point. And I would argue, you know, this is probably not the point for many of you, with many of the tools that you use, often you're choosing tools because of their ability to speak back to you in some way or push you in a direction that you hadn't anticipated. Um, and machine learning, I think, is one tool that's particularly good at that, again, because it's always going to give you some kind of output in that space, and it's likely to not be a compiler error, and it's likely to not be silence. It's going to be something a little bit different. All right, so that really concludes my whirlwind tour through the ways that I think about machine learning as a creative tool. Um, so in summary, I've talked about making it easier to use sensors, um, enabling people to communicate ideas and interactions through data rather than by programming, supporting rapid prototyping and exploration of ideas more quickly and more broadly, um, enabling creators to better communicate tacit knowledge and embodied practices to computers, empowering more people to become creators, and opening up new creative relationships with machines. So if um, any of this is interesting to you and you want to learn more, um, there's a bunch of resources I can recommend. Um, one of them is my MOOC, so this is free. You can go on Cadenze, you can watch half an hour of video and get a really good idea of how I made these demos work and do exactly what I did in these demos, or you can watch it for you know, 20 hours and learn quite a bit and become an expert in supervised learning. Um, if you are a programmer, Parag Mittal, one of our Goldsmiths alumni, has a deep learning course on the same platform, which is really good. If you're sort of a novice programmer, there's starting to be some other really cool tools out there that allow you to play around with generative methods. Um, one of those is ML5.js, made by Dan Schiffman at NYU. Um, and another one, hopefully soon, is going to be coming out of one of my projects at Goldsmiths in collaboration with Nick Collins and Thor Magnuson, where we're building a bunch of web-based generative tools for musicians and composers. We don't have anything to show you yet, but we're like weeks away from a website. So um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And HiBot thanks you. And I'm happy to take any other questions. <laughs>